There we go. Introducing the Track DZ, a groundbreaking driverless and zero emission electric tow truck. Revolutionizes operational flexibility for ground transportation of goods on industrial sites, logistic centers, and airports. Follows predefined routes, warehouse management system orders, or on demand requests via an app. Pulls up to 25 tons without dedicated infrastructure. Suitable for all weather conditions. Indoors and outdoors. Detects and avoids potential obstacles thanks to a full set of sensors. LIDARs, radars, stereo cameras, GPS, odometry, and inertial measurement unit. Wide angle of vision. Sees up to 100 meters at the front and 40 meters to the sides. V2X Communication Works with Easy Mile Fleet Management Easy Fleet Navigational Software for Mission Management and Route Optimization Tracked Easy The ideal autonomous solution for industrial sites, logistics centers, and airports Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live stream right here on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, brought to you by Easy Mile. My name is Sarah Barnes Humphrey. I'm the founder and host of Let's Talk Supply Chain, and I'm excited to host such a powerful discussion today. Today, we're going to be finding out more about Easy Mile and diving into the exciting world of automation. We'll be talking about the benefits, the role automation will play in the future of supply chain, and we'll be taking a closer look at the incredible innovations that Easy Mile are driving. I've collaborated with Easy Mile before, and we did an interview just a couple of months ago on the Let's Talk Supply Chain podcast, and I always love talking and working with them. They bring so much energy and passion, and the technology they're bringing to the industry is really just mind-blowing. So I'm really looking forward to sharing more with you in this live stream. Just a little housekeeping, feel free to comment and ask questions on the post during the show, and we will try and answer all of your questions during the conversation today. If not, we will be displaying the Easy Mile website and including an email in the comments so you can follow up with them directly. Today, I'm joined by three of Easy Mile's most inspirational leaders. So welcome Lauren Isaac, Bastian Montano, and Sherrod Argawal. Let's kick it off with some introductions. So why don't you tell us who you are, what you do, and the one thing that excites you about automation. Lauren, I'm going to start with you. Welcome. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much. So I'm Lauren Isaac. I lead business development for Easy Mile in North America. And I am most excited about automation is that it is really showcasing how technology can change everything. So obviously with the driverless technology, you remove the driver, but there are so many implications beyond that. I mean, it can change how you actually run your operation. It changes where you store your vehicles and it can actually change how people respond to the vehicles. So I think it's just got great implications for um, businesses and society in general. Absolutely, I love that. Sherrod, next, over to you. Uh, thanks, Sarah, glad to be here. Uh, Sherrod Agarwal, Senior Vice President for Easy Mail in charge of North America. I think what I love the most about automation is just the, the consistency. When you have automation, things become reliable, they become boring, they become, uh, you expect some of these things to start at seven and at eight, it's exactly what I want. So from an automation perspective, I look at it being exciting because it's actually pretty boring. Absolutely. And everybody's looking at automation right now and, and super excited about what it can bring to the industry. Bastian, last but not least. Yeah, hello, everyone. So I'm Bastian. I'm based in Europe. And uh, I am the business manager for the Track TZ, our tow tractor for the airport and industry. Uh, it means that I, I am in charge of the product development and pay attention to uh, to uh, to the market fit and the customer expectations. So 
yes, I'm quite uh, I'm quite happy to be here uh, today with you. And uh, regarding the automation itself, I'm really excited to make it happen now. Uh, <laughs> I mean, all these brand new technology are not just a trend or a dream. We deliver a reliable solution, and yes, for with a with a return of investment. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. Exactly. And this this discussion, we are going to be talking all about the different types of automation and, and so many exciting things. But I think we need to find out a little bit more about Easy Mile before we get started, because you guys have a fascinating story, really just an inspirational journey since the company's inception in 2014. So let's dive into that and share what that looked like with the audience. Lauren, why don't you take us back to the beginning? How and why was Easy Mile? founded what started that journey and where has it taken you over the last seven years yeah so back in 2014 like you said Gilbert Gagne our CEO and founder he was living and still is living in Singapore and he saw just how our cities have changed over the years and and as he was sitting in traffic and realized that you know we are we are dealing with growing um, greenhouse gas emissions congestion and just it's a lot harder to get around he saw there was an opportunity for change and he's he's a software guy he had actually started a, a financial software company in the past um and he was approached about a different driverless opportunity a driverless technology opportunity and he thought you know there is actually great potential here so he took his technology development skills to start Easy Mile. And back then he was started by focusing on the passenger movement side. So he partnered with a vehicle manufacturing company called Ligier. And in partnership, they developed the Easy 10, which is our driverless electric shuttle for moving passengers around. And that is where it all began because that shuttle since 2014 has been deployed in over 30 different countries in, in hundreds of deployments. We've actually operated over 500,000 miles in that driverless electric shuttle. But what's most exciting about this technology is that we were able to show its potential in that passenger shuttle, but now apply it to a whole variety of, of vehicles. So we're doing it actually for a bunch of different vehicles, both on the passenger movement side, as well as the goods movement side. Um, and I will mention, you know, we talk about in this, in this podcast, it's all about automating the whole supply chain. We're actually not automating the whole supply chain. Um, from this perspective, we're talking about the Tracteasy, which is the beginning. And that's what I think is exciting about the technology in general is that there are ways that we can leverage driverless technology and what we can do today. Um, and in this case, the Tracteasy is a perfect example of something. It works really great in the low speed environments in factories, warehouses, airports, um, any kind of industrial plants. Um, and, and because the environment is perfect for the state of the driverless technology. Amazing, amazing. And I can't wait to show everybody what that actually means for them and their businesses as well. So Lauren, you talked about how it all started with passenger shut shuttles. So let's take a look at that a little bit more. I, I have a video that I'm going to share with everybody that's going to bring what we've talked about so far to life. And so take us through that. Maybe explain the difference between the tractor and the shuttle so that we all have a good idea of those key products. So Bastian, I'm going to send that over to you and I'm going to play the uh, video at the same time that you're talking. Yes, so the, our tractor, the TrackTZ, is, uh, is designed to perform outdoors operations on private sites such as manufacturing plants or logistic centers, uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. TrackTZ is a driverless uh, and electric vehicle, which is developed with industrial grade components for efficiency, availability. Clearly, its DNA comes from the MHE, the material handling equipment. Uh, the second vehicle we have, so the Easy 10, clearly is a passenger centric shuttle. It is designed to operate on private and open area, such as city center, stone, university, or campus, and so on. These electric shuttles uh, run effectively in a wide range of environments, um, including uh, varying traffic conditions, changing weather conditions. And this time, its DNA comes from the automotive field, clearly. Awesome, awesome. And that was really great. And I love that video, right? Because you can really see the difference between what the shuttle is and what the tow tractor is and how it can really benefit 
companies and how they can use automation um, in a variety of different ways within their business. And so, Sherrod, I want to send this over to you because what does that look like in your customer settings? Because mm -hmm. I know you, you work across all sorts of sectors from factories to airports. Mm -hmm. How are your customers actually using those products and what challenges are you helping to solve? And just give us some examples, because I'd like to run sure. through some examples of what that actually looks like so the audience can get a good idea of what that means for them. Yeah, certainly. So we'll take two examples, uh, one about factories and one with airports. And so in the first case, uh, you saw in the video, uh, there's a car factory, which is a great example. When you have a lot of repeatable processes that are going a fair amount of distances. I mean, these factories are massive. They have multiple square miles. So there's a lot of movement between a warehouse to where the parts are being held. We have a lot of places that go from assembly to um, the drivetrain areas. We have a lot of different back and forth movements that are just regular all day long for seven days a week. So you have a lot of repeatable processes where the track easy can really be um, supportive in replacing those processes. And it, it kind of goes back to my consistency question. It's kind of a, it's also true. I mean, every second counts in a factory. So having the exact amount of time the vehicle goes from point A to point B is very important. So one of the challenges that we are solving is, is getting the keeping the production line on complete schedule. Um, in, a, in a factory setting. So I think it's a great use case for where automation can help out. Um, it's also very kind of long, repetitive work. So it's another where the, the, the automation is a great opportunity to, to replace uh, the existing processes. Absolutely. On the airport side, I think we've all seen the airport tugs when we're sitting in the airplane and looking outside and seeing the, the human come up with the, the tractor and unload the baggage. So there's a, a number of use cases around the airports. That's probably one of the biggest for the, the manned version of the tow tractor that TLD makes the Jet 16. That's the biggest use case. Um, so you can just imagine having how many of those tractors are running around on airports. In some cases, there's tens of thousands of those running around. And so being able to automate the process from the vehicle traveling from the airplane to back to the baggage storage or from airplane to airplane, you can imagine all the different areas where the um, the tractor would be, be moving. And, and same in the package delivery area. I mean, you have the same kind of concept. You have tens and thousands, hundreds of thousands of packages coming through in the middle of the night. I mean, those are great use cases that we could be looking at for um, the, the automation of the of the of that process. Well, and just imagine what that does to a process, right? Because you've got so, you've got a human at one end and mm -hmm. the other end, but in between, you've got automation and a robot to actually move that product from one end to the other. And one right. of the examples that I think we talked about in the Let's Talk Supply Chain podcast episode that we did was where it was running product from building to building. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think a lot of people in our audience audience if they have you know a few different buildings mm -hmm. and they're looking at moving product to and from i'd like to get an idea of you know the example that you, you have of that and what yeah. the roi was like what did the company get back from that sure so if you think about maybe an engine is a great example one that we all know so the engine has to be uh, there's parts to the engine that are housed in one warehouse and then maybe half a mile to a mile away is where they're actually assembled and so to be able to get the product from one spot to another, you have a consistent path of vehicles. Just, I mean, these are very quick processes. So, you know, if you're bringing six, three, four engines at a time, it's just a constant process. So you're, you're always bringing parts from one end to the other and then taking the engines back out and then taking them to the warehouse for storage or to the assembly line for where the cars are. So you have a lot of different processes that are just that are part of the supply chain, but they're not in the same building. And so having the vehicle to be able to go from each point is um, been a really supportive opportunity. And the ROI, I think, comes from a lot of different areas. And what's, I think it's really primarily from the efficiencies. And that comes from just the timing be right, right on schedule. Um, potentially, there's going to be some job transitions that are going to have support some of the cost savings. Uh, the safety aspect is huge. I mean, as much as these are very controlled sites, things happen. Engines fall off trailers. Uh, cars are you know, they run into walls. I mean, it's just very common practice in large settings. So I think those three areas really help on the ROI. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. And just the time that you're saving um, from people walking back and forth or mm -hmm. having to get into a vehicle and moving the product from one end to another. I mean, I can just I can just see the time back that people are going to get on a day to day basis, which is absolutely amazing. So let's talk about people, because when we talk about real automation for real supply chains, there's usually a big question on everyone's lips. Right. Mm -hmm. What about me? What about my job? 
And I know that we spoke about this in the podcast episode um, about how people are really thinking about this and how they're worried about what that looks like for them and what it looks like for their future. And I know that Easy Mile is really taking a look at that and making sure that humans are working with robots and that, you know, we're bringing everybody together in sort of that collaborative experience. So let's talk about humans working with robots. So what's the reality of integrating the two? How do they come together and how do they complement or maybe support each other? And what does that look like, Sherrod? And then if either you, Lauren or Bastian, want to jump in after uh, Sherrod, would love to hear from you as well. I think, Sarah, you actually provided the best example when we were talking about the airports. And you, when you have a process where you need humans at each end to unload or load the goods or the packages or the materials, then it's really the in-between stage of the driving where the automation can really be complementary to the humans. And so to be able to have um, people kind of focused on one of their, their role, which is to unload and, un and load and then have the vehicle drive by itself and we just keep making the efficiencies go, I think the integration um, is helpful for both the systems and also the people have a more of a, a consensus job uh, in that area. Absolutely. Lauren? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think to some degree, people almost expect a degree of automation. I mean, now when I go to the grocery store, I don't even go to a place with a cashier. I go and everything is done automatically. So there's also a degree of why isn't it all automated at this point, right? Like the technology is out there. Let's let's see it in action and let's see it solve some of our problems. So I think some surprisingly, people expect it. <laughs> and I think I think we're seeing more and more people get excited about it as well right because you think about some of the monotonous jobs mm -hmm. that people and humans are doing and they want to be able to embrace that automation they want to be able to say hey i don't need to do that part of my job anymore so i can actually give back to the company and do more with my position and what i'm doing in other areas mm -hmm. yeah all right, so Bastian, I want to ask you about this. Talking about how automation enhances that human element also brings me to the issue of safety, which is what Sherrod also spoke about before as well. Because, you know, although it might seem counterintuitive at first, if you don't know much about the technology, you might think that driverless technology is less safe. And we've heard that around you know, cars on the road or trucks being tested on the road as well. But apparently and actually it's potentially more safe because you're removing all of the limitations that we face, maybe like natural human error, things like that. So Bastian, talk to us a little bit about that. And then I'm also going to show a video while you're explaining that of um, how you your products actually uh, dock for zero damage. Yeah, clearly you're right. It's it's a, it's definitely a key point. Uh, I mean, uh, our vehicles, as you see previously, are evolving in different markets and different fields. But uh, from a safety point of view, uh, our vehicles are built on, on the same baseline. Our baseline is a safe by design approach. So meaning that we are not buying a platform and put some uh, some stuff on, on it, but we clearly design from zero to say, OK, we need to be safe at all times. So it means that we remove doubts or risk of malfunctions. Uh, and uh, in the same time, automation uh, is clearly uh, a added value, meaning that we are removing the tiredness for all these kind of drivers to fulfill some repetitive tasks, to move goods from uh, one place to, uh, to other place, uh, to do that uh, on day, uh, on night, and so on. So clearly, the technology yeah, is uh, definitely uh, uh, adding value on that uh, aspects. And um, I, I can say clearly that, uh, to be to be honest, on, on one hand, we need to take care about the comfort of our passenger. And uh, on the other hand, we need to, to manage the logistical flow to, to deliver goods at the right place and at the right time. But definitely, we want to perform this operation safely. And as it is a part of our core and design technology, this is clearly the, 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 the differential we, we could provide on the market. Amazing. Can you walk us through what we just saw there on that video? What does what does that look like? And how do you how do you make sure that the 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 um, shuttle or the tow tractor is actually moving safely? Because I think we saw a few elements of that where but but walk us through that video. 
Yeah, on, on this video, you see uh, what we call the, uh, the docking uh, uh, feature. So meaning that we are, of course, using uh, different sensors and so on. We are uh, using our redundancy. So we develop software, we develop hardware, and we make uh, we make all the links in between uh, to be sure that we are avoided any uh, any mismatch or any uh, issue. Uh, basically, we are not only uh, based our technology on one technology. So we mix uh, some technologies to be sure that we still have the top edge of uh, of uh, any uh, any sensors. And uh, at the end, we are certifying our our development. So meaning that we are able to provide a CE marked on the market to proof from a third party that we are safe. Awesome. And we've got some amazing comments coming through. So we've got Seaham that is saying shutting manufacturing lines down from no parts could be thousands per second as far as loss. We've got Davin coming in from Baltimore, Ontario. We've also got a question from Joseph. Can you talk a little bit more about fleet management? Who wants to take that one? Because I think that now is a really timely, it's a really good time to take that question. Yeah, I can I can grab that one. Awesome. I think that automation is, and I think Lauren had touched on it really well. I mean, we're not automating the entire part of the supply chain, but the portions of it that you need to start with to expand eventually out to the entire supply chain. And, and fleet management is the key thing because you saw a little bit of it on the video about how we have an, an easy fleet system where we can manage the vehicles remotely to be able to see where they're going, move the routes, change what, what they're doing, and be able to see into the vehicle, see what the vehicle is seeing. So in being able to, fleet management in this case, is really about how to manage the routes and how to manage the processes. Um, the vehicles will go exactly where you tell them to go on the, on the schedule you tell them to go. So it's a little bit different than when we have managing a fleet of buses or managing a fleet of manned drivers. So the, really the main process with fleet management is making sure that what we call missions or routes are, are constantly being adapted and changed to be, to be most effective in the, on, the, on the plant. Awesome. Thank you for that. We've got a comment from Harold. Automation is required to compete in the yep. bottom line of business. What do you guys think about that one, Lauren? <laughs> I totally agree. In mm -hmm. fact, um, we haven't gotten into the question about what about your, your people in terms of like loss of jobs. We always get asked about that. And I think that's the key is that these businesses actually are going to be more competitive and be stronger in the end because of automation. And that's only going to create more jobs. So I think that's that's an important kind of link to make between automation and labor. Um, but just in general, I mean, automation is the key to efficiency, um, the key to making the best of your resources. It might mean that your labor starts to change their skill set um, because now instead of maybe driving, they're actually managing the fleet management system that Sherrod was just describing, you know, where they're actually keeping track of where the vehicles are and where they need to be going. But now at least you're not worrying about the vehicle driving into an airplane or or disrupting the flow of packages. I mean, it's just a very, it's a totally different shift for a company, but in a very positive way. Absolutely. We've got another couple of questions from Joseph, but I want to stay on the people track for right now. And Sherrod, you know, how do we, how do we, keep uh, workers happy to share the load, right? Because essentially that's what we're doing and that's what we're talking about. Are they seeing benefits and embracing automation as a part of their roles ongoing? Is this something, and I talked about this before about them being excited about it, but also being a little bit wary of what the future yeah. looks like for them. So talk to us a little bit about that. And my other question is, if they're not excited about it, if you've got a few people that are kind of on the fence, how do we get them excited about that? Sure. I think the key thing is, is that there are there's going to be job transition. There's going to be changes in roles and changes in the way uh, factories are run, where airports are run, but it's for the better for the worker. I mean, they're going to be doing a lot more skilled labor. I think the, the consistency of driving back and forth will be more of the parts that are automated, but where the skilled labor is still going to be required. Um, we're going to have a lot more increase in the, uh, the training for the maintenance staff to get higher level um, training to be working on electric vehicles and automated vehicles. So I think ultimately the first piece is that their, their skills will be improved on the, on the roles that they're playing, and they're going to probably eliminate some more of the redundant tasks and the more of the ones that are not um, that doesn't take as much of their their experiences. And then second, and Laura mentioned it, there will be more jobs. I mean, with the automation will improve by, by eliminating some of the redundancy, they'll start to increase more and more opportunities for those that are there. And I think anybody that has a job today is just going to see better opportunities in the future. 
Awesome. And so Lauren, let's go back to that. Is automation kind of helping with retention? I mean, as we get into a new workforce, right, we've got the next generation that's coming up into all sorts of business sectors, including supply chain. Is automation going to help businesses retain that talent? Because we're already talking about how <laughs> difficult it is to find that talent, mm -hmm. right? And now it's really important for us to be able to retain it. And so is automation going to be a really big part? part of the strategy that businesses are, are going to use to retain talent. Absolutely. And just getting at kind of the heart of what you're saying, I know across all industries, finding people to be drivers is a massive challenge. So yeah. um, retention is extremely important. Um, absolutely. Because the nice thing about, you know, technology and automation is that it is a change, so it requires training. And training is a proven tool for retention. So people do get excited. And the other piece of it is whether you're a driver or like a passenger in one of our shuttles, there is so much excitement that comes from this technology. I mean, my three-year-old talks about driverless vehicles as if it's a normal thing. <laughs> but if you look at people as they get older, they people don't, like my grandparents don't believe it's real. So you look at this range of reactions that just the ability to actually get in one and understand it. Um, I think is huge. So from a retention standpoint, I think people are really excited and engaged to be a part of it, to actually have that experience and then be able to like share that because it is so novel at this point. Absolutely. And Clem Clement says the change transition must be accompanied by end customers. It's about social transition. Thus, trainings are needed. So talk to us a little bit about that. When it comes to people, what is the training that's involved when somebody is working with Easy Mile? Bastin, do you want to take that one? So uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure we, we can just uh, put a, a, strength, uh, a strength answer, but... Uh, Basically, you know, um, as I said, um, automation already starts, uh, you know, more than two decades. So meaning that we already start this kind of discussion since a long time ago. And it will it will not clearly a nightmare. I mean, we already have some good knowledge. We have some new uh, new things coming with uh, with uh, with technology. So meaning that, uh, yeah, now we need to, to finalize to finalize completely the, uh, the overall processes. So, yeah, clearly it's, it's not a, a matter of uh, what 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 could be the, uh, the the result if we already in? I mean, the train is coming, so we need to jump in, <laughs> and at the end we need to finish the job because, yeah, you know, this world world approach are clearly change all these kind of players. So, the the shortage of uh, of driver already exists before any COVID situations. So, meaning we need to manage this situation right now, and it's it's a part of our stuff just to put technology safe and reliable on on the field clearly. Yeah. Yeah, and I think with all of the new rules and regulations that have come with COVID that have come up over the last couple of weeks, we're going to see even more shortages depending on how people feel about, you know, vaccinations and different things like that. So it's very real. It's very, very here. Sharad, did you want to answer? Did you want to add anything there as to some of the trainings that you sure. provide when you're working with your customers? Yeah, I think the, the first one that's probably not long term, but we initially have a safety driver in all of our vehicles. So we have initial safety driver training so that the, the local operator gets very familiar with how the vehicle runs both in manual and then in automated mode. And we do run a number of hours with that as a starting point before we go to level four full automation on the track easy. I think where we're going to see a lot of the training transition is, is that you, you go from being an operator to a remote supervisor. Uh, into being more of a field technician. So there's going to be a lot of training that we're, we're starting to, to the different people on the ground. We're starting to show them how the differences are between the vehicle and automation. And I think in reality, the vehicle is still very much a, a manual, a mechanical vehicle. So I think the, the training on that part is, is very limited. It's really on the electric and then also on the automation on the software side and how to read some of the error codes. And that's where the training is, is important, um, both for the operators and then the maintenance technicians that are on the ground. Yeah, and I think you're bringing everybody into the equation, right? To really mm -hmm. get a good understanding yep. as to why you're there 
and why your products are there and why mm -hmm. the company has chosen to work with Easy Mile, what that looks like not only for their job, but for the overall operation and also getting people excited about it. Because yes, it comes down to people within the company, but it's also going to come down to Easy Mile and how you're integrating and training people as well. Right. So before we get into sustainability, which is a really, really good one for me, I'm very excited about that because I think there's a really good element here of sustainability that I want to talk about. There is a question from the audience. So can the track easy be integrated into any existing warehouse management system or do you have your own system? Now that's a really great question <laughs> and it's probably something that you guys get a lot because when we're looking at new technology, of course, we're thinking about integration and who do I need to get involved? Is there IT and how many different people do I need to do that? So let's talk a little bit about that. Who wants to take that question? I can just bring the part of, uh, of the answer for sure. So sure. WMS uh, is clearly uh, different in different region and different uh, fields. So meaning that we, uh, we, we, want, we want to be compliant with all of them. But to do that, we are not big enough to say, okay, this is a, this is a great way to do. So meaning that we open our system. So meaning that we are able to managing our vehicles. So meaning shuttle or track easy with our proper system, our own system. But we already had some APIs, meaning that we are able to connect to every other system. Yeah. So the key, point is, the key point is here. We need to manage our flows. We need to manage our vehicles, but we still need to keep an eye related to all the other flows because at the end, we cannot have the better decision if we are alone. So meaning we need to comply with the others. Yeah. yeah. Lauren? Yeah, if I can add, I think that it kind of reflects the Easy Miles business model in general, which is that we really focus in one area, which is the technology. And we know that that is our specialty, the driverless technology. And then we partner with established vehicle manufacturers to be able to leverage what they do best, vehicle manufacturing. And related to your question, Warehouse management systems are going to be very kind of unique and specific to each of the respective warehouses. Um, and we let those developers make that, you know, as as best for specialized for what they do. So um, Easy Mile does um, what we focus on, our driverless technology, and then we integrate with all of those other systems. And how what does that look like? Is it easy? Does it take a little bit of time? Pretty straightforward with APIs. I mean, I'm not a an API integrator, so I couldn't tell you, but from what I hear, those people, it's actually pretty seamless. <laughs> awesome. And just a comment from the audience from Andrew, it looks like he might work at Easy Mile. Whenever I'm on site with clients who are implementing autonomous solutions, they're excited by our training processes and how it allows them to have their own competence on the vehicles and be in control. That is a really, really great point. And Andrew, I'm so glad that you brought that up because you know, we talk about integration, we talk about training, but I think it's really about empowering your customers to embrace the technology and be able to use it as optimal as possible in their processes. Sharad, do you have anything to add on to that? No, Andrew's right. I mean, he's seen it probably best more than any of us in the last uh, six months. So I, I think that being a part of the process, any, any kind of adoption that you would like to get from people is having them be a part of it and see where it benefits them is always the best way to go. And I think there's more and more we can continue to integrate them and take their feedback on the processes, the better it will be for us to, to be successful. Absolutely. And we've got another question from the audience. I work in automation in Europe and there's a real appetite here for outdoor automation and material handling. Is that the same in the US? So we know that Europe is really, really embracing automation. Are we seeing that same kind of transition in the US or is it a little bit further behind? I think in all of the, the developed countries, I mean, driver shortages are there. Uh, it was there before, like Rashi mentioned before COVID and it's probably gonna be there for a long time afterwards. And so I think the adoption for automation is high. Our customers have told us directly, I mean, they, they have gaps. In that area, the safety area is very important to them. The timing is very important to them. So I think all areas in supply chain point to automation in the US or in, in Europe. I mean, I think that's a very common. We're seeing that everywhere. Well, and if I'm sitting there thinking that I do want some sort of automation in my processes where I think Easy Mile can really fit in, what questions am I kind of asking myself before I give your team a call? Probably, yeah, probably the first question you would like to ask is uh, 
are we able to uh, switch my manual processes to these automatic processes? And it is clearly a, a good question, but at the end, we just need to think differently. At the end, you, you don't want to copy and pass something. You just need to create something new because you need to put some added value. I mean, it, we have the, op the opportunity to do better. Why we just want to cope with the existing systems? I mean, so the first thing is to say, okay, what is my end goal? What, what, what really I want to achieve? And probably the, the best option is to just uh, streamline all your processes to say, okay, where can I improve my, my cost, my, uh, my, I don't know, my resources and so on. So clearly this is the first things uh, I would like to start if, uh, if, I'm, if I'm just to judge this. Yeah, that's that's a great and it's it really comes down to mindset, especially top down mindset and what exactly you're trying to achieve. Right. All right. Let's talk about sustainability, because I mean, we can't talk about the potential that automation has to greatly improve the supply chains of the future without talking about sustainability. It has been one of the most, if not the most important considerations right now for a lot of organizations. So how can, an, how can incorporating automation into your supply chain enhance your sustainability strategy? Sherrod, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to you first and then if Lauren or Bastian want to uh, okay. um, come in, then we can do that as well. The, the first, the easy answer is everything is electric. So from a sustainability perspective, I mean, we are converting diesel and gas vehicles into electric. So in the sense that you're always going to have uh, your vehicles are run on, on full electricity for the products. So that's the easy one to kind of see in the sustainability angle. I think the other areas is that when you have autonomy, um, you're very, very efficient. So in some cases, you're running a process, you might two, you might need two or three vehicles because there's brakes and there's gaps and there's timing um, as, as backups, you won't have that in automation. So you might be using less vehicles, so less production in actual manufacturing of product, which would reduce um, the carbon footprint from, from that perspective. Um, so I think the efficiencies are, are gonna really help in the sustainability and having the electric side of, the, of all the products being electric will reduce overall the carbon emissions out there. Absolutely. And, you know, there's there's a lot of different, you know, when we talk about sustainable development goals, there's a lot of different things to think about. And carbon footprint, I mean, when it comes to su supply chains, we are one of the biggest industries that are contributing to that. Mm -hmm. And so every little bit helps. And so when you're thinking about a sustainability strategy, what are the values that you can closely align with? What are the things that you can do right away? And who are the companies and partners that you can partner with to really help enhance that strategy? Lauren, are you seeing some of this in, in your discussions as well? Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it is such a huge topic right now at federal and state level. Yeah. And like you said, transportation in general is the, I think it's the largest, if not the second largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So this is an incredible opportunity. I mean, just, just, the ability to switch your vehicles from diesel to electric is massive. And then when you add in the other kind of efficiencies that come with automated vehicles, I think it's just such a huge opportunity. And it's true across the board with passenger movement, um, goods movement. I mean, and everything makes a difference at this point. And the nice thing is there, there seems to be a lot of incentives around that mm -hmm. as well, financial incentives. So yeah. um, I think it's, it's a good, great opportunity for public and private organizations. Yeah, I think the I think the federal governments are helping across the world and trying to accelerate the automation or the electrification and hopefully soon automation, especially like on the airport side uh, and in the public sector. So I think that's an opportunity right now to jump into the sustainability by getting a lot of incentives and and reducing costs to acquire the vehicles. Are you are you seeing the government providing grants that could potentially help with uh, offset some of the cost around the automation? Uh, definitely on the FAA side in the U.S. Um, we haven't seen in, in as detail on the, on the private sector and the factories and maybe Europe, Bastion, there might be some other opportunities uh, for private companies to be able to grab into them. But definitely on the passenger side, uh, we're seeing a lot of federal incentives. The fleet side, I think President Biden actually announced that they want to make the entire U.S. fleet by 2035 electric. So hmm. they are going to be providing incentives, building charging systems, building infrastructure. So it's definitely being supported by the federal government. Amazing. Bastian, are you seeing any of that in Europe? Yeah, clearly in Europe, we, uh, every, every single innovation pop up everywhere regarding this electrification of uh, all kinds of stuff in the, in the MHE, uh, especially. Um, yeah, clearly our, our, our governance. So when I say governance, meaning that Europe are clearly uh, 
helping a lot with a huge and massive grant to help all, all kinds of uh, different uh, fields. So from port industry to, uh, to logistic industry, to, so it's quite, it's quite huge and quite amazing to see how we would like to improve uh, this uh, sustainability in a short term. Because at the end, the, the, the key point is clearly on the short term, because we don't want to, uh, to wait again 20 years, because yes, we need to change and we need to change now. Yeah. Absolutely. And I love to see that, right? I mean, governments really need to get involved and help private sector and help organizations and businesses get to where they need from a sustainability standpoint. Um, Davin says training is a key component to get customer buy-in, not so much top level buy-in, but down with the actual users mm -hmm. is key. Thank you for that. I think that that's a great observation as well. Just want to let everybody know in the audience, if you do have any questions, now's the time to put it into the comments because we definitely want to get to your questions. We are going to get to the future part of this conversation, which is one of my favorites because, you know, we're talking about here and now and what is happening right now, what people are thinking about automation. If you're not getting on the train, you're going to be left behind type thing. But, you know, how far into the future, you know, that we what are we looking at when we're looking that far into the future, right? What does the future hold? So Bastian, what opportunities in automation are going to be brought to supply chain that organizations really need to be thinking about? Because we all know if they're not getting on the bandwagon now, they're going to be left behind. But if they're, you know, if we're looking further into the future, what, what does it look like for organizations? So if I may just a step back, yes, as I say, supply chain has already shifted into automation for a long time with uh, what we call the AGVs. Right. So for now, challenges, so for the future, are really to manage the overall processes because we want to increase flexibility. Why? Because we need to adapt our resources faster mm. and again, in a sustainable way. As we see, we are able to uh, just to order few uh, different platforms, everything in less than 24 hours a day. I mean, it's, it's, it's just quite impressive. So we need to move forward, but quickly and faster. So again, uh, thanks to our experiences, we gain uh, from different projects uh, around the world. Um, what can I say today is our technology is now capable of uh, handling new potential use cases. So yeah, clearly the adding value is now. With new technology, we're able to do new things. And when, when I say new things, clearly, it's where, yeah, in the past, we are mostly limited or impossible, definitely. And so, it, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. No, I, I just say that it allows, a, uh, if I just uh, make an example regarding the, the tow tractor. So now it, it allows us to um, just to cope with various environment and traffic condition and across indoor or outdoor, because during the last few weeks or during the last few months or during the last few years, we clearly definitely are able to automate inside the building. So we need to think about it. So now just think bigger, so think outside. Definitely, it's, it's definitely a key. So are we gonna be seeing the Jetsons? Like we're gonna have drones flying around and then we're gonna have cars flying around and maybe trucks flying around, I don't know. But, yeah. but you, you probably already know that drones are always inside the building because when you need to, to check all the references inside this warehouse, it's already done by it's drone. True. I mean, <laughs> yeah, clear, clear, clearly, it's a, it's, it's a no-brainer. I mean, <laughs> it's already done, as I said. <laughs> it's true. I just have. I just, I just remember watching the Jetsons, and I'm like, is that what we're going for? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So, Lauren, what do you think we can expect from Easy Mile over the next few years? Few years. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say the Jetsons creator had some great insight into the future. Um, <laughs> um, no, with Easy Mile, I, I mean, this is why I joined Easy Mile. It's that we are kind of riding the technology wave. We are riding the automation wave. So. Back in you know 2014, 2015, when the driverless shuttles first came out, they were largely being showcased in parking lots so that people could see them moving and see what they could do. And now we have these tracked easies, so an established vehicle that that TLD has made and is operating all over the world. We're we're automating those vehicles and putting them in real world environments so that they can solve real problems. So so that's where we're at today. So now you know fast forward, we're going to be doing it adding that, those autom the automated technology to other vehicles. We're going to see an expansion of what the technology can do. So the vehicles will be able to go faster and operate in more complex environments. Um, and I think the potential will just keep growing. So that's that's what it, what's exciting is that these 
the vehicles have technology on them. And as the technology gets better, it's kind of like upgrading your iPhone. You're going to get to see those benefits on the vehicle, you know, in real time. So um, it's it's here and I think it's here to stay. And now it's just a matter of like leveraging it. So I think it's really exciting. Absolutely. And I'm excited to see what the future holds, what you what other products you put this technology on so that we can see more and more automation in supply chain. Sherrod, what are the industry trends that we should keep be keeping an eye on? One of the things that I want to ask you as well is I hear from people all the time. Technology is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. So how do I keep up with that and how do I even just you know, get started, but know that in a little while we're going to have to update or change because technology is changing all the time. So can you answer both of those for me? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, the trend is definitely towards automation, and especially in the supply chain. So I think that if you start with just looking at your own processes and seeing if you have a lot of repeatable processes, short distances, labor shortages, then you're definitely a key opportunity for automation. And I think the, the, the best thing about automation, which is maybe we haven't seen in, in the past with mechanical vehicles and even with electric, it's so much software driven and software, like Lauren said, is updatable. And so there's not really an up, there's not really a place of missing out because if you get okay. into the technology now, it's in, from an easy mob perspective, we're always updating our software. So you're still getting the best of what we have to offer you know, ongoing into the future. And so I think the key thing that the opportunity now, even with electric also, electric is the same way, batteries are being updated through their software. So you're always going to consistently get the best in, of the technology that's available. So there's no, uh, being a first mover is not a disadvantage like maybe it was in the past when you'd have to buy a mechanical vehicle and then replace the whole thing. Um, so I think getting in now is really a, a great opportunity for the trend uh, in industry. Well, and we're all used to that, right? With our, mm -hmm. with our iPhones and yeah. our phones and, and all of the technology that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, I don't think there's anybody out there that's not used to an update unless they're using maybe a flip phone. Yeah, even, even cars. I mean, we know that more and more of the cars are having automation uh, in, in software updates and being driven by electrical. I mean, mechanics have to be a lot more electrically inclined and software inclined now because the fact that the vehicles are so much more um, driven by software. So I think that's a trend that we all see and is going to be even faster in the supply chain area. And I think, you know, a sigh of relief from the audience going, Oh, I only have to deal with updates. I don't yeah. have to deal with, you know, yeah. looking at a brand new technology a year right. down the road. So knowing that I'm implementing something that I'm going to have to completely change in a year going, how do I, how do I do that? How do I sell that? How do I get my team around it? You know, all of that kind of thing. And so if it's just an update to software, I think that that's amazing. So I, I think the have, oh. sorry, go ahead. So I was going to say, I think the trend, of, I mean, if we look at the entire industry of automation, they're all using a similar type of technology, a combination of the same hardware, whether it's LiDAR, camera, or vision. So we don't we don't expect in the next three years some like amazing new thing to come out where all the technology has to be changed. I think most companies are committed to the processes and what hardware and, and, and primary LiDAR is, is bringing to the industry. And I think that's the advantage that you're not going to see this massive shift in a few years. This is what we're going to do. It's just going to be the software being updated. Awesome. Awesome. So we've got two last questions from the audience. Do you think companies that switch to automation during the pandemic will struggle to see the benefits of their investment being that it's costly to maintain? Ooh, who wants to take that one? <laughs> Shrot? Yeah, I guess I can, I can try to take a shot at that one. Um, I think the, the cost of automation is high in comparison to the current mechanical vehicles that you buy. So an automated electric vehicle versus a manned vehicle is, is going to cost you four or five times more to start. Um, I mean, the good news is you're depreciating that over a decent period of time, just like any other vehicle. So you're going to see some of that spread out of that cost of automation. I, I think to be the key to the automation is, is if you're, you're going to have automation where it still requires the same level of, of manual support or operations, then you're not going to get the cost there. So it's really when you're looking at automation, be very clear that the roadmap is level four in the very short period. Otherwise, you're going to end up having a lot of cost in the beginning without any of the returns. And so the I, I think the likelihood is, is that we're maybe not there just today, but in the next few months, next few years, I mean, it's definitely there. So when you're looking at automation, make sure that the, the, the cost savings are built into the, the future. Um, but I would say in, in some ways he's right that right now you're not going to see the benefits, but it will be there in the next you know, several months and years. 
I think that was a great question. And thank you for answering that, Sherrod. So finally then, what is the one key point that you would like the audience to take away from our LinkedIn Live today or our live stream today? Lauren, I'm going to start with you. Sure. Yeah, I, I think the key is that the driverless technology is here today. I think people find that shocking. Um, it definitely has a long way to go. I mean, we are not just plopping vehicles out in absolutely every operating environment and expecting them to be fully driverless. However, we do actually have technology that can be fully driverless today in certain environments. And that's why we focused on the Tracked Easy, where we can deploy them in factories, warehouses, airports, because those operating environments are very feasible for what the driverless technology can do today. And we've built it and we know we can deploy it in a way that's entirely safe and can be really effective. So um, I, I think, you know, even though we get excited talking about the future and we love to reflect on the past, where we are today is actually really a great opportunity. It's such an exciting time. I mean, I say that about <laughs> supply chain all the time, but even in automation, right? Real automation for real supply, supply chains. I mean, this conversation couldn't be any more timely. Bastian, over to you. What do you think is one thing you'd like the audience to walk away with? I mean, our technology is, is ready uh, to take uh, as a processes or the automation uh, onto the next level, to be, uh, to be, uh, to be frank. But again, uh, this is not only a matter of we're pushing technology. This is because real business case are existing now. And again, it means that we need, we need just to deliver it. So we are ready to do that. Just push the button. <laughs> just by a push of a button. I love that. It's so easy. I mean, that's probably why you named it Easy Mile. I would assume. <laughs> this could be. <laughs> All right, Sherrod, what's one thing that you would like the audience to leave with today? I think the goal of automation is to not think about it. So the, the more and more we can press to say that the automation is just, it's, a, it's an afterthought, it's just happening, we don't have to think about it. And that, that's the key thing with automation. And, and we're there and investions, right? I mean, we, we can do this now and we can show uh, fully driverless vehicle technology and it's just gonna keep getting better and better. And so. You know, very interested in seeing on other business cases throughout the audience if there's other areas we know kind of a few major ones we mentioned with the factories and the airports but we'd love to hear other areas where uh, business cases could be great for automation in the supply chain because um, we're still learning and we'd love to take an opportunity to review that i i'm excited to see where easy mile goes i'm excited to see where automation goes i'm excited to see where supply chain goes so thank you so much to Lauren, Bastian, and Sherrod for joining me today. And a big thank you to Easy Mile for making this live stream happen. Automation is going to play an important role in the industry moving forward. And it's conversations like this that really help to educate, to inspire, to really get us thinking about the potential, particularly in light of COVID with the challenges we've faced over the last 18 months and the new normal we're all still adapting to. To find out more about Easy Mile and how they could help your business, head over to their website, easymile.com. And a final thank you to you, the audience, for listening and participating and engaging with us today. I hope you enjoyed the session and are filled with lots of ideas to take back to your own businesses. Don't forget to let us know if our live stream today has helped you kick off a dialogue in your business or implement a new technology. We always love to hear your feedback. So we'll be seeing you again soon. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you.